As the adventuring party ventured deeper into the dimly lit caverns, they stumbled across an unexpected sight. A hovering jellyfish-like creature emitting a soft, eerie glow. The air around them grew tranquil as the peculiar creature cautiously approached, its tendrils undulating gently. Despite its otherworldly presence, the creature exuded an aura of benevolence. Its large, lidless eyes conveyed a sense of curiosity rather than hostility. Tentatively, it communicated through a series of gentle psychic impulses, offering guidance and warning to the adventurers of unseen dangers ahead. Its calm and presence and genuine desire to aid the group left the party both fascinated and grateful for its unexpected encounter in the depths of their perilous journey. If from that description you know what we're talking about, buckle up as we dive into the lore and history of one of D&D's most helpful monsters. Today we are talking about the Flump. Hello and welcome to Dungeon Deep Dive where we talk about all things D&D monsters, from monsters and their lore to their publication history, where they originated and how you could use them in your D&D games. In today's video, we're going over the jellyfish denizen of the underdog that warns adventurers of dangers ahead, the Flump. It begins its first lease on life in the 1981 Advanced Dungeon and Dragons Fiend Folio book, where they are actually the only creature in the entire book that has a lawful good nature. They are described as saucer shaped and pure white in color. The mouth is at the center of the upper surface and at either side of the mouth is a four inch long eye stalk and the underside carries a mass of small spikes and numerous small tentacles. The flump, in quotation, flies by sucking air into its mouth and expelling it through its underside. There are not many monsters that have survived the test of time all the way up to 5th edition, but flump is one of the lucky few. If a flump in the 1st edition was ever to be attacked for whatever reason, why, because why would you want to attack something so adorable? They would try and repel the attack by secreting a foul smell and liquid in a 60 foot arc that would poison anything in range in hopes of making them flee in disgust. The liquid would shoot out from the main body of the flump and any creature hit by it would smell horrendous for a number of hours. If that doesn't seem to work, then the last resort for the flump is to float above the target and drop on their head, impacting them with its collection of spikes on its tendrils. Now moving on in the years to second edition, our flump friends make their reappearance in the 1995 AD&D Monstrous Compodium Annual Volume 2. Nothing new is really added to the description of the flump, but we do get a variant called the Monistic Flump. We are told that the standard flump could not speak or communicate with any language, but did have an ability to communicate using a unique sign language that makes use of their tentacles and eye stalks. There are some monistic flumps that can speak and understand common and other languages though. We get a detailed description on how the flump hunt. We are told that they hunt small lizards and other small critters by hovering just above the ground to snag them or hiding in vines to camouflage. With them also being like a highly psychic creature, they can also feed on psionic energies in the area. If they do capture a small critter, they then secrete digestive acid into the victims until it is dead, where it will then settle on the corpse and absorb all the nutrients through the tentacles. But given a brief description of their habitats, they are primarily nomadic hunters, but do sometimes meet with other flumps to reproduce. The reproduction cycle of a flump is about every two years called budding, producing 1d8 tiny flumps on its underside. These become independent after about three months when they reach two inches in diameter and they grow to adult size within a month and they live for around 20 years. They class as quite low on the food chain when it comes to the underdark with their flesh apparently tasting foul but ogres and goblins will still eat them if given the chance. Now for the monistic flump these variants are a more advanced offshoot of the flump and they do actually have the ability to cast some spells equal to a cleric level the same as their hit dice level. They gather in groups called cloisters to share knowledge and to worship deities not well known on the surface world. The inside of a cloister is decorated with fine colorful paintings made by flumps dabbing natural pigments with their tentacles. The paintings are usually abstract showing spirals and other curved lines though some are vaguely representational of flumps engaging in hunting. You can sort of see these as like cave paintings for the flump. Original members of the cloister are called the monks where one cloister could hold up to 32 monks at one time and these monks were led by a leader called an abbot. Some cloisters have been known to adopt mind witnesses and take them under their tentacles to help change their worldviews. In 3rd edition, they had their own little adventure in Dungeon Magazine number 118 called Box of Flump, set in a generic port town where the salt mines are played with a repulsive stink. The PCs are hired to keep an eye on a small time hustler and learn he kidnapped a family of flumps. After that, little April Fool's jokes popped up through the years involving the lovable jellies with articles being made called Lawful Great, One Flump's Epic Journey 
to Heridum, which includes a stat block for a male celestial flump. In fourth edition, as part of the 2009 April Fool's joke, a stat block for a flump was published in the Fool's Grove Dungeon Delve article. Nothing else was really published on them besides that. It was quite barren for the flump. Now, coming on to the current fifth edition, flumps made its mark in the current monster manual. If you have ever encountered a flump in the wild, they are very intellectual creatures and possess a wide range of knowledge on different subjects. The fact that they have a strong telepathic ability means that they are extremely susceptible to evil thoughts and feel a need to share these thoughts with any good aligned creature they can find to filter these thoughts out of their mind. Flumps have a range of colours that they glow to show their emotions. If they are a pinky colour, that means that they are amused. If they turn into a blue shade, it means they're feeling sad. And if they're glowing green, that means they've had their curiosity peak. And if they start to glow a menacing red color, that means that there is something irked them and made them very angry. Sometimes flumps are actually hunted because some of their body parts can actually be used to craft certain magical potions. Specifically, the brain, when powdered down, can be used to make levitation potions and the inner lining of their tentacles can be used to make oils of acid resistance. Even the glands in their body that they use to shoot out their foul smell and defense spray is actually a material component for the spell Stinking Cloud. Okay, so we've gone over the history of the flumps, their lives and their habits. Let's go over their stats in case for some reason you wind up fighting these lovable levitators. These small aberrations have an AC of 12 and a tiny wee little seven hit points. They actually have a walking speed of five feet, which I was surprised at, but a flying speed of 30 feet. They have a vulnerability to psychic damage and can understand under common, but can't speak it, but have a telepathic ability to speak with up to 60 feet. They do have advanced telepathy where they can perceive the content of any telepathic communication used within 60 feet of it. And it can't be surprised by creatures with any form of telepathy. They have an ability called prone deficiency, where if the flump is not prone, roll a die, and on an odd result, the flump lands upside down and is incapacitated. At the end of each of its turns, the flump can make a DC 10 deck save, writing itself and ending the incapacitated edition on a success. I love that they threw that in for an ability that it could just land upside down, kind of like a tortoise, and it's just helpless until it flips over. I love that. Their telepathic shroud ability makes a flump immune to any effect that would sense its emotions or read its thoughts, as well as all divination spells, so it can't be scried on. For its actions, they have a tendril attack that has a plus four to hit and a reach of five feet and deals 1d4 plus two piercing damage and 1d4 acid damage. And at the end of each of its turns, the target must make a DC 10 con save or take an additional 1d4 damage on a failure or ending the recurring acid damage on a success. A lesser restoration spell cast on the target also ends the recurring acid damage. And finally, once a day, they have their stench spray attack where each creature within a 15 foot cone originating from the flump must succeed on a DC 10 deck save or be coated in a foul smelling liquid. A coated creature exudes a horrible stench for 1d4 hours. The coated creature is poisoned as long as the stench lasts and other creatures are poisoned within five feet of the coated creature. A creature can remove the stench from itself by using a short rest to bathe in water, alcohol or strangely vinegar. Now, of course, I've scoured the internet for some more variants of this creature because, you know, that's what I do. And I found some variants on the flump on, from the, again, the Reddit user or high mark. So thank you for making these, dude. Appreciate it. Starting with the monistic flump, it has the same AC of 12, but it has 17 hit points. So it has 10 more hit points than the original and has all the same abilities except for a peaceful aura where a creature that attempts to harm the flump must make a DC 12 wisdom save throw or be charmed by it for the next minute or until it takes any damage. According to the block, it does lose its tendril attack, but it is replaced with a blissful apathy attack where each creature the flump chooses within 30 feet must make a DC wisdom save or become charmed and incapacitated for the next minute. I have never seen a monster that was in a fiend folio book be so passive. Moving on to the flump infiltrator. It has an AC of 12 and 28 hit points. And this sneaky bean is slightly more tougher than other flumps. Similar to how the monistic has a peaceful aura, the infiltrator has an indifferent aura where a creature that attempts to look at the flump must make a DC 12 wisdom save throw or be compelled to avert its gaze. So all the attacks against it would be at disadvantage. A creature that fails to save becomes indifferent to the flump's presence for the next minute and retains no memory of the actions the flump takes while the creature is affected. It has an attack called Spiny Drop where one creature that the flump is flying over must make a DC 10 deck save or be poisoned until the end of its next turn. While poisoned this way, the creature takes 2d6 acid damage at the start of his turn. A creature that passes the saving throw by 5 or more knocks the flump prone in the adjacent space. 
So essentially the flump drops on your head and if you make the save by five or more, you knock it off and knock it upside down. That is hilarious. And finally, we have the venerable flump. This big boy is a huge aberration with an AC of 13 and 59 hit points. These guys are clearly the bruisers of the group. This variant gets an aura similar to the others called empathic aura, where creatures within 30 feet of the flump have advantage on inside checks to determine emotional states. This floating little air ball gets a multi-attack where it can make three attacks with its tendril pods. Speaking of which, the tendril pods have a plus four to hit and a 15 foot reach, and on a hit, the target is pushed five feet away. And on a critical hit, the target is not prone. You can already see that these guys are like extreme support characters. It also gains the spinning drop attack where one creature that the flump is flying over must make a DC 12 deck save or take 4d6 bludgeoning damage and be poisoned for a minute. While poisoned in this way, the creature takes 2d6 acid damage at the start of its turn and a creature that passes the initial save by 5 or more knocks the flump prone in the adjacent space. You can repeat the save at the end of your turns, ending the effect on a success. These guys are very adorable and great to throw in a D&D game to lighten the mood if needed. Ways you could encounter this creature are, as your pot is sitting on camp for the night, a flump could float towards you, emitting a soft or bioluminescent glow. And through telepathy, it can communicate distress that a nearby community of flumps is in danger. And a malevolent force has been corrupting the surrounding area, turning peaceful creatures aggressive and endangering the balance of the ecosystem. And the flump can request you to assist in investigating the source of the corruption and putting an end to it. I feel that's a great story beat right there. Or you can have an encounter where you're scouring a library buried deep within an ancient ruin. And you could encounter a flump that was like a librarian there that keeps all the tomes and scrolls organized. This flump could reveal that an artifact containing immense magical power has been stolen by a group of malevolent wizards. And this artifact, if misused, could bring catastrophic consequences to the realm. And the flump asks you for your aid to retrieve the item and bring it back to its rightful home. But that is all I have for you guys today on the flump. Thank you all for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. And if there's anything that I've missed, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. This creature has been very fun and refreshing to research. I actually loved researching all this and I didn't know a lot of stuff about it. I knew it existed, but I didn't research anything until now and I absolutely love these guys. What monster do you think I should cover next? Let me know in the comments below if you have any suggestions and if I pick yours, I will add your comment at the end of the video. You can find all links to all my socials down below to keep up to date and thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.